Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I'm very excited because I finally found some time to start this series on the density matrix and mixed states, which is a subject I find fascinating. Now, I want to clarify that I'm going to be covering this topic in the context of quantum computation and quantum information. So there are a few prerequisites in order for you to be able to follow the video. So uh, first, it's important that you already understand how to represent uh, state vectors. And that is uh, both using Dirac notation. So for example, let's say just a simple state zero, right, in Dirac notation, and also in the um, uh, state vector representation in, in a column vector. So uh, the cat zero is, is equivalent to the, the column vector one zero, right? Uh, it's also important to understand uh, the evolution um, of states through unitaries. So, for example, if uh, we apply um, a Halamar gate to this zero state, uh, it's important to, to know how this evolved into what is commonly known as the plus state, which is the superposition, equal superposition of the state zero and one in the computational basis, right? And lastly, it's also important to understand how to represent multi-qubit states. So if we have, you know, the Kronecker product of uh, state zero with state zero, well, it's, it's important that you understand that this is equivalent to tensoring or doing the Kronecker product between um, the column vectors one, zero, one, zero, which gives a column vector of the form one, zero, zero, zero. So if you understand these basic concepts, I think, I think it should be fairly easy for you to follow what's next. So uh, to get started, what I want to do is present um, a motivational example uh, that will give us an idea of what mixed states are and why the density matrix is, is an important representation or a convenient representation. So, so let's say, you know, we have our main characters, Alice and Bob, right? Uh, so we have Alice and Bob. And let's say that Alice wants to send a qubit to Bob. So let's say that uh, she's going to do this over and over again. And she, for simplicity, let's say that she prepares the state one. So qubit preparing state one. And, you know, this could be uh, prepared, let's say, in the, in the polarization, in the form of the polarization of a photon. And she's going to transfer that to Bob through, let's say, an optical guide here. And then Bob's going to receive something, right? Now, let's say that along the way, there's some noise that is affecting this, this, um, this channel. So let's say there's some, some noise here. And what this noise is causing is for the, the, the qubit that Alice sends, it's causing it to flip, but with some probability. So, you know, let's say Alice is trying to send qubit one, and sometimes it, it flips to state zero with 50% probability. And then with the other 50% probability, the state just remains unchanged. So, so uh, in this case, you know, Bob will receive state zero on his side uh, half of the time and will receive state one the other half of the time every time Alice tries to send uh, this state one. So now what we're interested in is, is understanding or, or trying to build um, a framework to deal with this type of problems, right? So the question is, well, you know, we're dealing with quantum states. So is this equivalent to just treating this as an equal superposition of state zero and state one? So, you know, is, is Bob receiving zero or one the same, uh, well, zero, one, each with 50% probability, the same as just receiving the state one over two, zero plus one. And, and the, you know, intuition tells us, yeah, probably not, right? That's probably not the case. But, you know, an easy way to see this is, well, what happens if, you know, right after Bob receives this state, 
he applies a Hadamard gate, right? So if he applies a Hadamard gate, well, you know, this uh, half of the time he's receiving the state zero. If we apply a Hadamard to state zero, well, this turns into state plus, right? The other half of the time he will receive state one, so that will turn into state minus. And, you know, if we perform measurements, if Bob then performs measurements, let's say he puts a measurement block right here, well, when measuring state plus or minus, um, he's always going to get, you know, 50% of the times state one, 50% of the time state zero, right? No matter which one he receives uh, plus or, or minus. But, you know, if we were to treat this as a superposition of state plus and minus, and we apply a Hadamard gate, well, that just, just turns into state zero, which means that if he performs a measurement, he will get zero 100% of the time, which is clearly not the same as, as what we had here above. So, so this here is not the same as just treating this two separately and, and seeing how the states evolve um, independently. So how can we, you know, um, come up with a convention to, to deal with this? So, you know, in, in, in classical probability, theory, um, which is, you know, what we're dealing here with, right, this, we just showed this not a superposition, a quantum superposition of zero and one, these are just classical probabilities of receiving state one or state zero, what we will typically do is, is treat this as ensembles, so, so groups of, of items with associated probabilities, so we could write, you know, for example, here, Alice has, uh, before sending her qubit, uh, state one, and um, we can associate with it a probability, a probability of one, right? And then when she sends this to Bob, so let's say she sends this to Bob, well, we saw that there's some noise here, right? So we have this noise. And then this will now give us a different list of items. So Bob is receiving, you know, state zero or state one. And with each of these, we associate a probability of one half, right? So 50% for zero, 50% for one. And then if we wanna just keep track of the evolution of the states through unitaries, well, we will have to, let's say, if we apply the Hallamar gate, we'll have to update this list for each individual item. So now he will have state plus or state minus, and each of them with, um, you know, probability of one half. So, you know, we can even take this one step further, right? So, so let's say now Bob wants to apply another gate. And, and let's say he wants to apply the S gate to, to, his, um, to his qubit. But let's say that Bob's hardware is kind of finicky and, and this S gate is not working quite well. Uh, and, and let's say that the, the gate only gets applied with 75% probability. So let's say that with 75 probability, um, this block here applies an S gate, but then the remaining 25% of the time, um, the gate doesn't get applied, which is equivalent to just saying it's applying an identity gate, right? So I'm gonna denote this little block here, you know, as some sort of combination of the two, right? And and we're curious or we want to know well, what happens here, right? So we have to follow a similar approach to what we just did here. So so let's say now Bob is going to apply this, you know, S gate that is not working quite right. So what states do we get? So just as a reminder, um, you know, if you apply an S gate um, to, to state plus, which is one over two, uh, zero plus one, the, that just um, applies a, a phase of I on state one. So we get this state one over two, zero plus I one. And this is sometimes denoted as uh, the state plus I. Um, I don't like using this convention because it makes you think that maybe you have, you know, state plus Kronecker with some other arbitrary state i. So I prefer you calling this the state uh, 
L for left, and in the block sphere, this is on the left side of the y-axis, so, um, uh, sorry, the state R, state R, so on the right side of the y-axis. And um, again, if we apply an S gate to state minus, well, this just um, gives us something very similar, but with a, uh, an opposite phase, so zero minus uh, I1, which um, I like to call the state left or L. Uh, so in any case, if we apply this, um, this non-ideal gate to each of these individual items that, that Bob has, the plus and the minus, well, now we need to consider all possibilities, right? So, so now we say, okay, well, if the S gate got applied and Bob had the state plus, well, that, as we just said, that's going to turn into the state right, right? The R state. And with what probability? Well, he received state plus with probability one half, and then the S gate only works around 75% of the time. So we'll have to multiply it by three quarters, right? That's 75% that's of the time. So, so this is you know, equal to uh, three over eight probability. And then, you know, he could also have received state plus, but the, the S gate didn't work. So that means the, the plus state remains unchanged. With what probability? Well, he received the state plus with half probability and 25% of the time, the S gate doesn't work. So times one quarter, that's one eighth. And then we can do the same thing for state minus. So state minus turns into a state left with three eighths probability and then remains unchanged with um, one eighth probability, right? And, and this probability should add to one, right? So, so, and they do, they do add up to one. So as you can see, uh, here, there's there's a few things we need to um, to highlight. First of all, this states we we've been dealing with this this ensembles of items with associated probabilities like this one, this one, and this one. These are what are known as mixed states. So mixed states are uh, those states that are composed of um, of what we call pure states, um, and they have associated probabilities uh, of occurrence. And um, then you can say, well, um, this doesn't seem you know, very clear. How come a state like the state plus is not a mixed state? Um, I mean, after all, the state plus has some probability associated with it, right? So, so with with half probability, if I measure, I, I get state uh, zero, and, and with half probability, I get state one. So how come this is not a mixed state? What makes it different? Well, mixed states have uh, associated with them classical probabilities, not quantum probabilities or probability amplitudes. And, and another clear distinction is that um, you can say pure states really don't have um, uncertainty associated with them if we measure them in the right basis. So if, for example, I were to apply a Hadamard gate to my, my, um, my plus state, we know that with 100% probability, we're always going to measure state zero, right? After applying a Hadamard gate, the state plus turns into state zero. If I measure it, there's no uncertainty associated with it. That's equivalent to changing the basis in which I'm measuring the state. And that's what we can say about pure states. Pure states are those in which we can always find a basis in which we can measure them to find the same state with 100% probability. So, so that's the difference between a mixed state and a pure state. A mixed state is, is an ensemble of pure states with associated classical probabilities of occurring. And a pure state is just a quantum state with quantum probability amplitudes that if you change its basis, you can always measure it uh, a, a state with 100% probability of occurrence. Um, now, the second thing to highlight here is that, as you can see, I, I wanted to make this example a little bit more complicated than just applying the Hallamar gate. That's why I, I went ahead and, and also applied this, this kind of finicky S gate to show that 
um, if we have noisy processes in which we have to look at classical probabilities and how they affect states in different ways, uh, keeping track of what's going on can get really cumbersome is we, if we treat them just as ensembles. So, you know, if we keep working with this long list of elements, then we need to keep track of the evolution of the states separately, right? So if Bob were to apply now more gates after this, more unitaries after this, we'll have to separately keep track of what's going on with each one of them. So this is where the density matrix formalism comes in. A density matrix is just another way of representing states that it's a little bit more elegant, a little bit more compact and, uh, than using these ensembles. And, and that's what I want to cover in the next few videos. Now, just to give you a taste of, of um, how a density matrix would look like, uh, if we have, for example, uh, the state plus, you know, uh, its density matrix is basically just given by the outer product of uh, the state plus with itself. And, and this is what we're going to see um, for pure states, is, is simply just taking its state and, and applying the outer product with itself. Now for mixed states, like the one we had before, let's say this one, the one that Bob received right here, um, what, what we see is he has uh, two states, state zero, state one, with classical probabilities. And the way we will represent that state uh, in the density matrix formalism is uh, as a weighted average of each of the states uh, weighted by the probability associated with them. So we will write it as one half of state zero, outer product with itself, plus one half of state one, outer product with itself. And then, you know, this outer products are matrices, and as we will see later, uh, we can represent them um, um, accordingly with, with the matrix itself. So yeah, so that's it. So in the next few videos, what I want to do is first introduce the concept of the density matrix for pure states, then move on to mixed states and how to represent them using this new formalism instead of uh, using this ensembles uh, of, of items. Uh, then I want to talk about some of the properties of the density matrix and, and why are they so convenient. And lastly, I want to cover uh, how can we represent mixed states in the block sphere. Uh, you're probably familiar with the representation of a pure state in the block sphere, but we can also expand that concept to include mixed states. So I uh, hope you liked the video. If you did, I'll see you in the next one.